We're going to talk about advances in diagnosis and treatment of advanced idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Advanced Parkinson's disease is when the patient has the disease for a longer period of time, they're on more medication, they have complications such as endose failure, wearing off, and they may have complications that are of cognitive aspects and also neuropsychiatric aspects. So our outline is on pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, the etiology, signs and symptoms, algorithm for the drug therapy, adjunctive drug therapy, which is key in advanced Parkinson patients. We're going to go over two case studies, and we'll talk about new concepts and advances that are in the future. This is a conceptual diagram of the phases of Parkinson's disease. This is a diagram by Shapira that appeared numbers of years ago, and it talks about phases of Parkinson's disease. This has two phases. Recently, there has been some consideration for three phases. I will discuss the two phases here and elaborate on the third phase. So this diagram shows us on the vertical the percentage of remaining dopamine neurons that are present. And that is the red line, and that starts on the left-hand side. On the horizontal, there is the premotor phase, which is on the left, and the motor phase, which is on the right. In the center of that is a line that says the diagnosis, and that's when the patient has the diagnosis made. So, as you can see, the red line shows that there's an ever-decreasing number of dopamine neurons, and hence dopamine, as the disease progresses. And in the premotor phase, the non-motor symptoms start to occur. And that line shows that it starts to increase, and as it increases, there's more loss of dopamine cells. Motor symptoms we'll talk about later, but those gradually increase as the disease progresses. And then the motor phase, that's after the diagnosis is made from the trio of rigidity, akinesia, and resting tremor, all with asymmetry. And you can see they increase not only the motor symptoms, but the non-motor symptoms, but also the loss of dopaminergic neurons continue. Now, a new phase has been added to the left called the preclinical phase, and that's by Stern, Lang, and Werner. And they've added this in because they want to have some awareness in research and in the evaluation of patients of a preclinical phase, which involves such things as genetic markers, molecular markers, and biological markers. The pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease is demonstrated in this slide. In the bottom part, we have the midbrain, which has the substantia nigra. And it is the substantia nigra that has the cell bodies that are gradually deteriorating, and these cell bodies make dopamine. The axon goes all the way up into the caudate and into the putamen. And when there is loss of these presynaptic neuronal capacity and these dopamine neurons, there is less dopamine that goes up into the putamen and into the caudate. This is also the area where the DAT scanner has its imaging. And in the DAT scanner, there is a reduction of image as there is a loss of these presynaptic neurons that are present. In the area of the putamen, there is also the postsynaptic neurons that are present. The Brock hypothesis is an evolving concept of disease progression and timing, and it's based upon the Lewy body and its pathological findings. You can see on the left the various areas of the brain that the Lewy body is determined. And on the horizontal plane, there is the various stages of the Brock classification. So in stage one on the left, only the olfactory bulb and the vagus nerve is involved with Lewy bodies. In phase two, it spreads to other areas like the locus ceruleus, and in phase three, it's the substantia nigra, where the dopamine neurons are, and there is the loss of dopamine, and there is significant motor features, and this is a classical feature of Parkinson's disease. After that, 
the Lewy body spreads in a progression in a timing that has a definite sequence. It becomes into the area of the neocortex and in the cortical area, giving many other non-motor symptoms. What is the role of abnormal alpha-synuclein aggregates in Parkinson's disease? The Lewy body, which is abnormal aggregation, misfolding, accumulation of alpha-synuclein, and they are a prerequisite for the postmortem diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, Brock and colleagues hypothesized that Lewy bodies spread throughout the brain in a predictable pattern as Parkinson's disease progresses. And it appears that this is probably really the case. The pathological studies in Parkinson's patients have found Lewy body pathology not only in the brain in a sequence and in a timing fashion, but also in the cardiac area and the enteric autonomic nervous system. It is not known whether alpha-synuclein aggregation is a direct causative factor in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's, or whether it's a protective mechanism against protein-induced cell toxicity. There are advances now in the understanding of alpha-synuclein, and it may be evidence that it acts as a template contaminating other alpha-synuclein areas or proteins that are not involved, or it may act in some way as a messenger or a transmission protein that can spread the disease. The Lewy body here is shown as an eosinophilic area, which is a cytoplasmic inclusion, and it looks somewhat pink. It looks like a bullseye. It is a collection of alpha-synuclein and other proteins. Now let's talk about potential markers in premotor Parkinson's disease, because we'd like to have a way of actually diagnosing Parkinson's before they start to have motor complications. Well, we have the radio tracer imaging, the DAT scanner. The DAT scanner is a SPECT scanner, which has an isotope that is taken up in the putamen caudate area. And that's the area where the axone comes from the substantia nigra, which is a dopamine producing neuron, and goes up to that region where the presynaptic neuron is for the substantia nigra. Now, if the presynaptic neuron is normal, and there are plenty of them, you'll have a normal image. But when there is a reduction of those, the image looks less. And the isotope that is used actually binds to a transporter reuptake system for dopamine, and it shows this image. Now, the second area shows olfactory testing. And loss of smell, or hyposmia, is definitely shown to be present in Parkinson patients. 80 to 90 percent of the patients with Parkinson's disease have loss of smell. And oftentimes, it anticipates the clinical motor symptoms. Hence, it may be used as a marker. Constipation is also a consideration. In a study in Hawaii, in Asian populations, it was shown if you have only one bowel movement in three days, you have a four-fold increase in developing Parkinson's. But 80% of those patients didn't develop Parkinson's. And of course, genetic testing is very important. We now have significant genes that we can test for, LARC2 and others. The transcranial ultrasound is being used, but we don't use that very often, and that may be diagnostic. How sensitive it is, we're not certain. Cardiac imaging is also being used, and it's based upon the fact that there is distal dopamine deficiency in the cardiac areas. So we're talking about pre-motor markers that may be a benefit. Now, the dopamine transporter imaging we talked about and on the left is a DAT scan normal image. You can see that there is a good uptake of the isotope with a symmetrical image. On the right is a Parkinson patient, early stage, but you can see there is less isotope taken up because remember that isotope is taken up 
by a dopamine transporter receptor. And if that is deficient because of presynaptic neuronal capacity loss or loss of dopamine cells, then there is a reduction of this uptake. And it's abnormal in Parkinson patients plus some other diseases. Now this is a slide of DAT scanner imaging. And on the left, it shows the normal uptake. A few different colors, but it's the same idea. And you can see on the left, symmetrical uptake of the image. And this is a patient that has essential tremor or maybe normal because a DAT scanner can differentiate between Parkinson patients and patients with essential tremor. And probably between patients that have vascular disease, which will look probably normal, drug-induced Parkinson's, and also probably psychogenic movement disorders. Now the next three slides on the right are abnormal DAT scanner imaging. And they show that there is reduction in the image. There's some asymmetry, or there's symmetrical reduction as in the mid image. And then on the right-hand side, there's reduction of the image, but also there is significant asymmetry. This is consistent with Parkinson's disease, with multi-system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, and Lewy body disease. So the DAT scanner isn't 100% sensitive in diagnosing for Parkinson's disease. You have to add in the clinical features. What's the etiology of Parkinson's disease? Well, the specific causative factor is unknown, but we know that it's probably a double hit phenomenon. Genetics and environmental factors probably interact or act separately to cause this disease that we call Parkinson's disease. There are rare families with inherited abnormal genes, and there are major epidemiological studies that suggest that genetic factors play a larger role in the younger onset patient, and environmental insults play a larger role in the patients that have their onset after the age of 50. Remember that age is the greatest risk factor. Also importantly, we know that these genetic aspects and environments combined. So let's talk a little bit about the proposed etiology of Parkinson's disease. Information is growing rapidly every year. So on the left-hand side, we have genes, which is genes for alpha-synuclein, Parkin, UCHL1, LARC2, and other ones. On the right-hand side are environmental aspects, including pesticides, rural living, and fungicides. Now these two probably come together and they get involved in the pathological mechanisms that are present in the etiology of Parkinson's disease. Now, alpha-synuclein is a normal protein that occurs, but there is something that happens and it's caused to aggregate. It misfolds, and then it causes a development of the alpha-synuclein from going from the presynaptic area, transported down to the cell in the cytoplasmic area, we find the Lewy body, which is kind of like the dumpster or the trash can for the alpha-synuclein that's either mishandled or is not able to be handled. That is thought to be a very important consideration now for the etiology. And now it's thought that there may be some kind of template that can occur, influencing other alpha-synucleins, or it can act like some type of messenger to involve other cells like in the prion disease. Now, mitochondrial dysfunction is probably a significant factor in some Parkinson patients, especially complex one. Oxidative stress, inflammation, excitotoxicity, and actually immunological disease may play a role. But all of these pathological mechanisms bring about apoptosis, which we call cell death. Cell death, which is represented by the Lewy body and occurs in the area of the substantia nigra and the dopamine cells are dysfunctional or lost. Now, what are the risk factors? I mentioned age is probably the greatest risk factor. Genetics is important, environment, herbicides, pesticides, and rural living. Genetic testing is very important. And now we have the 23andMe. You can Google that to arrange it. You spit a little saliva into a tube and you send it off. There may or may not be a cost. 
Genetic testing has expanded with the discovery of the LARC2 gene. And now we know that 1% to 5% of the sporadic cases are related to LARC2, at least in part, and 5 to 13% of early onset familial cases are related to LARC2. It probably has a geographical and somewhat of an ethnic propensity. Park gene and other genes are important. Recently, we've discovered the concept of the glucocerebrosidase gene. We now have 16 genes to help us in understanding Parkinson's disease. Also, the messenger RNA may play a role, and exactly how that plays a role, we're not certain. The diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease we've discussed. It's a trio plus one, resting tremor, bradykinesia, akinesia, which is slowness, rigidity, asymmetry, and postural instability occurs later. If you have falling and gait disorder very early in a patient, they probably don't have Parkinson's disease. What they probably have is either comorbidity or they have an atypical Parkinson's. There are really no specific markers yet, but we've talked about some of the potential markers, constipation, loss of olfaction or loss of smell, talked about depression, and of course, REM behavior disorder. Probably we will need more than one marker because of the heterogeneity of the disease, but biochemical markers and molecular markers are rapidly being investigated. So the signs and symptoms of advanced Parkinson's disease, because that's what we're talking about in this session, is resting tremor that's prominent. It becomes refractory, or it occurs when it's wearing off. Akinesia, slowness, rigidity, all of these things get worse when the patient is off. Postural instability, freezing, occurs. More common in late patients with advanced Parkinson's than in early Parkinson patients. And of course, dyskinesias are a hallmark of motor complications along with wearing off, but it occurs more in patients with advanced disease and peak dyskinesias and diphasic dyskinesias. Peak is when the plasma level is higher, diphasic is more in the legs when it is wearing off or when there is a reduced plasma level. Wearing off is much more common in advanced patients and it's a difficult management problem. Endos failure, delayed on, never on. That's related to taking the medicine with food, which should not be the case, especially for L-DOPA. L-DOPA needs to be taken a half hour to an hour before meals and never on taken with food or there is delayed gastric emptying. In advanced Parkinson patients, there's speech and swallowing dysfunction that's major problems. And of course, behavior and cognitive decline is very commonly seen in advanced Parkinson patients. Common symptoms in all neurodegenerative diseases, anxiety, panic attacks, apathy, depression, fatigue, sleep disorders, a key mark here is REM behavior disorder, falling is common, usually later in advanced patients, fear of falling, and frailty, all common neurodegenerative signs and symptoms. Now, non-motor symptoms we've talked about, we divide them into three categories, cognitive, psychiatric, autonomic, and sensory and pain. We've discussed some of these, but anxiety, depression, fatigue, slow thinking, hallucinations, sleep dysfunction are all very common in advanced Parkinson patients. Sleep fragmentation, excessive daytime sleepiness. REM behavior disorder can occur with Parkinson patients and it occurs in 30 to 50% of the patients, but it can anticipate the diagnosis when it's based upon motor features. And it is found that in patients who have REM behavior disorder, if you take those patients by themselves, 60% of them will develop some kind of difficulty such as Parkinson's disease, Lewy body disease, or multi system atrophy. Restless leg is more common in Parkinson patients. It's not a marker. So markers in cognitive and psychiatric are depression and REM behavior disorder. Autonomic abnormalities, non-motor symptoms occur in advanced Parkinson patients. Drenching sweats, a common complaint. The patient goes off and they have severe sweating. 
often seen in advanced patients, dyspnea, and orthostatic hypotension, more of a sign in advanced patients. Almost all patients have orthostatic hypotension. Early, it's non-symptomatic. Later on, it becomes a problem and is symptomatic, and people can lose consciousness. Sexual dysfunction, salaria, is more prominent in advanced patients. Constipation, one of the markers, and urinary urgency or neurogenic bladder or ex overexcitable bladder is common. The neural aspects of pain and sensory are very key, and they're seen in advanced patients. Tingling sensation, akathisia, the sensation of a Parkinson patient wanting to get up and move around all the time, and they can't get rested or settled. Olfactory deficit, we talked about. And if they have it as a pre-motor symptom, it can help with the diagnosis. Diffuse pain, back pain and shoulder pain, often present in patients, or patients with advanced disease are thought to have some other entity. Hot, cold sensations, burning, restless leg, and neuropathy are a significant aspect. Now, what's the burden of disease in Parkinson patients? It's significant. It accumulates as the disease progresses. Reduced quality of life, reduced activities of daily living. We treat patients so we can improve their quality of life and improve their activities of daily living, and it's a difficult chore in the advanced patient. Depression, cognitive loss, apathy, anxiety, and hallucinations. Frequent falls and fractures, hip fractures, subdural hematomas. Increased office visits is common in the advancing Parkinson patient. It's an economic cost. Hospitalizations are more common. Increased nursing home placement occurs in advanced Parkinson patients. And one of the big reasons there is nursing home placement is because of cognitive and neuropsychiatric aspects. So the diagnosis and treatment is aggressive so we can improve the patient in activities of daily living, quality of life, their motor function, behavior, and cognition. We want to be able to reduce caregiver time because extent of caregiver time is directly related to caregiver depression. Caregiver depression and time needed to care for that patient are directly related. Delay of nursing home placement would be ideal. It's important for families. It's important for cost. And we want to treat patients with medication and counseling if they need. Conflict management is a very important counseling tool for patients with Parkinson's disease. How to solve the problems these families deal with. The treatment for early Parkinson's is non-pharmacological and pharmacological. We've talked about non-pharmacological. Education can never stop in a Parkinson patient. You always need a good support group, much more in an advanced patient. Family has to come together. You may need to hire help, and that's an important consideration. Exercise is an ongoing important aspect of all Parkinson patients. And by the way, it's been shown now, if you exercise an hour for five to maybe seven days a week, and you increase your heart rate to a 60 to 80% heart rate maximum, you can delay the progression of Parkinson's disease. Centers like Iowa and other areas have shown that as a very significant feature of exercise. Pharmacological therapy, MAO type B inhibition, dopamine agonists, and L-DOPA. And in the advanced cases, we want to talk about DBS, but we have to select those very carefully. This is an algorithm for the treatment of early Parkinson's disease, but it's also an algorithm for the advanced Parkinson patient. We make the diagnosis based upon if they have rigidity, akinesia, resting tremor with asymmetry, and they have a robust response to L-DOPA. We evaluate their characteristics, and in the advanced Parkinson patient, we're going to be dealing with the moderate, severe disability and impairment, and the patients are usually older, 70 to 75 years of age, and many of them will have significant comorbidity, and some of them will have cognitive impairment and neuropsychiatric impairment. Now, in the advanced cases, we can consider they may be mild to moderately disabled, and we'll think about not just starting L-DOPA, but thinking about dopamine agonists. 
Now, the agents we commonly use in the management of Parkinson's disease, and we have L-DOPA as the most robust drug, but there's a new formulation. It's called Rotari. The FDA should be releasing this, and this is a drug formulated to release in the small intestine. And as the drug goes through the small intestine, it releases L-DOPA gradually, and it has a longer plasma half-life, and you have an opportunity to maintain the plasma level much longer, up to five to six hours in these cases, giving better quality of life, better activities of day living, and also reduced off time. COMT inhibitors like Tocopone and Enticopone can be added to L-DOPA. They, like Azelect, reduce the off time by one hour. MAO type B inhibition, Selegiline and Resagiline or Azelect. We use dopamine agonists to delay the onset of L-DOPA, but most patients that have advanced Parkinson's, they're on L-DOPA and they have the complications we talked about. Anticholinergics can be used in advanced cases, but they're limited because they can cause cognitive impairment. And NMDA receptor antagonists are very important. Amanadine is the one that's probably most important now. There's some in research, but it can help reduce dyskinesias and give some benefit in allowing more available dopamine. This slide shows the site of action of Parkinson's disease drugs. We have L-DOPA, it's not absorbed in the stomach, it gets into the small intestine, and it's there absorbed into the plasma. It has the possibility of being broken down by two pathways. We want to try to reduce that pathway where L-DOPA is broken down so we can get more L-DOPA into the brain. So we use carbidopa, which is in Cinemet, to block the pathway from L-DOPA to dopamine. And we use a COMT inhibitor, such as tocopone and endocopone, to block the pathway to 3-O-methyldopa. By these two agents, we have the opportunity to get more available L-DOPA into the brain. Now, when it gets into the brain, it goes into the neuron at the presynaptic site somewhere from the substantia nigra to the presynaptic neuron. And L-DOPA is taken up by the neuron, and L-DOPA then is formed into dopamine. Dopamine is released from the vesicle, and it goes into the synaptic cleft, and it attaches to the dopamine receptor on the postsynaptic receptor site. This is the dopamine that acts as a neural messenger to the other neuron and it sends that message because it's a neurotransmitter. But dopamine also has a possibility or the capacity to be absorbed or taken up by the dopamine neurotransmitter. And that dopamine receptor that's on the presynaptic neuron is where the DAT scanner's isotope takes up. And so if the neuron is intact and not dysfunctional, then that isotope will show an image that looks normal. Once the dopamine is in the presynaptic neuron again, it can be recycled into being used as a neurotransmitter. Dopamine agonists act right on the postsynaptic dopamine receptor. And dopamine agonists are taken by mouth, or they can be sub-Q, or by a patch, and they bypass this loss of presynaptic neuronal capacity, or loss of dopamine cells, that are present because the substantia nigra cells that produce dopamine are dysfunctional or absent. Now, MAO type B inhibitors help block the breakdown of dopamine, and so dopamine can be used more as a neurotransmitter. There are selegiline and there is rosagiline. How do we evaluate the use of a drug? Well, it's important to remember that clinical trials really give us the evaluation of a drug. And the FDA will not release drugs unless they go through a clinical trials. So it's evidence-based medicine. And they have to go through a significant number of trials. And trials now cost up from 800 million or more dollars to conduct to get a drug out on the market. Now in our office, we do clinical trials and we've done 
the clinical trials on every major Parkinson drug that's come out in the last 30 years. I always advise patients to think about getting involved in clinical trials. So what does a clinical trial do? Well, it gives us this important triangle, efficacy, tolerability, and safety. The clinical trial gives us efficacy. How well does the drug work? That's efficacy. It gives us a glimpse of the tolerability. That means the side effects. It gives us some idea about safety, but it only gives us a little view of safety because most of these studies have about three or 4,000 patients or more that go through clinical trials, but it takes 100,000 patient exposures to pick up the most idiosyncratic or rare safety problems. We use these three factors to evaluate the use of the drug, efficacy, tolerability, and safety. Theoretical considerations are really the last consideration for the use of a drug. Efficacy of dopamine agonists, how do they work and why are they efficacious? What's the data? They're better than placebo in monotherapy or adjunctive therapy, especially adjunctive therapy, they're a benefit. Additional benefit with L-DOPA, they reduce the need for L-DOPA, they reduce the dosage for L-DOPA, they're effective as monotherapy, they delay dyskinesias, delay motor complications, that also is motor fluctuations, and there is some evidence in the laboratory and in the animal models that may have some neural protection. But what are the side effects? Drowsiness is significant, excessive daytime sleepiness, sudden onset of sleepiness, nausea, orthostatic hypotension can be made worse, loss of consciousness can occur, ankle swelling, red and swollen hands, and the impulsive compulsive disorders have been described, and also possibly fibrosis. Adjunctive drug therapy in advanced Parkinson's disease can really be summarized in this slide. First of all is L-DOPA, first line drug, usually in advanced cases. It's always first line if there's significant cognitive impairment or neuropsychiatric impairment. New formulation is Retari, and they are little beads. They are absorbed in the small intestine, and that drug's name is going to be Retari. That's not out yet, but hopefully will be out in the very near future. COMT inhibitors are commonly used. Dopamine agonists are used with caution. MAO type B inhibitors can be used, but in cognitively intact patients. Anticholinergics like cogentin and artane, amanidine and apomorphine, the dopamine agonists at sub-Q. There is another form of L-DOPA that's being used recently. It's in trials, and it's the L-DOPA intestinal gel. And that may be a benefit. It has a lot of side effects, and it may get out on the market fairly soon. And of course, in advanced Parkinson patients, deep brain stimulation, DBS, may be used. But selection of the patient is key. So this is a slide that goes over the disease process and highlights the therapeutic window as it narrows in an early, moderate, and advanced disease. This therapeutic window is about L-DOPA. The vertical there is the therapeutic window, and you can see it's the block that occurs in early, moderate, and advanced. It gets narrowed. So let's look at the early disease. You take L-DOPA, and the L-DOPA is absorbed quickly. You get a significant therapeutic response. There's no dyskinesias, but there's a little bit of wearing off or endose failure in some of the earlier diseases. The middle panel shows us moderate disease. You get a fairly rapid response when you take L-DOPA. Remember, the half-life is 90 minutes. You have to take it a half hour to an hour before meals, but it develops a dyskinesia. And dyskinesias occur, but they're usually not severe. Then the plasma level, or the therapeutic response, diminishes, and you have more endose failure or wearing off. In the right-hand panel, you have advanced disease. L-DOPA has a fairly rapid rise, you have a narrowing of advanced therapeutic response, and you have dyskinesias, and you have more wearing off that is seen on the right-hand area of that panel. 
So you have narrowed therapeutic response. The drug doesn't lose its efficacy. It's that the disease progresses. So L-DOPE is the most robust treatment, but it has the most frequent motor complications. And we've discussed those, wearing off, drug-induced dyskinesias. But one we haven't discussed is dystonias. And dystonias are sustained posturing, and they can be off when the patient's plasma level is, is low, or they can be on when it's peak. They're usually off, and in the morning, it's the foot turning in or the cramping of the foot at night, and it can be as the patient wears off with their L-DOPA dose. Wearing off, as mentioned, can be motor and can be non-motor. So patients often ask, how do I know when I'm off or I'm going off? Well, when the L-DOPA drug is wearing off, the plasma level is getting lower, the patient will have tremor, bradykinesia or akinesia, as documented by getting slowness of getting out of a chair, or rigidity, or postural instability. Non-motor symptoms certainly can have wearing off phenomenon. Fatigue, anxiety, they can become depressed when they're off, mood changes, difficulty thinking, slowing down in their thinking, pain, sensory features, more salaria, and they without question have more sweating. That's a common non-motor off symptom. So adjunctive treatment with MAO type B inhibition. Selegiline, it's been shown five milligrams twice a day. There's been studies that show it can be used as an adjunctive therapy in advanced disease. Resagiline, one milligram in the morning. There have been two adjunctive trials, the Presto trial and the Largo trial show that you can reduce off time by one hour and reduction of off time is better than placebo. And the reduction of off time is actually equal to anticapone. Adjunctive dopamine agonist treatment has a rule. You go low and you go slow. And you can use ropinerol immediate release or ropinerol that's extended release and pramipexol extended release or the immediate release. By and large, with ropinerol, we can go up to 24 milligrams a day, and pramipexol up to 4.5 milligrams a day. But importantly, usually most patients respond somewhere between 1.5 and 3 milligrams per day. The rotigotine patch can be used, and that maintains a more consistent, higher plasma level for the dopamine. But importantly is that it is built up to 12 milligrams, and that's about the highest dose we want to go. The extended release forms are important, and of course we talked about apomorphine as sub-Q. Other adjunctive therapy is anticholinergics. Anamanidine can be used, it benefits uh, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, but we use it most in patients with advanced disease to help reduce dyskinesias. And DBS, deep brain stimulation, is certainly important consideration. Other adjunctive therapy for other symptoms, depression, you can use tricyclics, SSRIs, anxiety. There's not a good drug for it, but SSRIs can be used. Cognitive loss, the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, rivastigmine can be used, and it's a benefit. It's now in a patch. Brand name is Exelon. And for neuropsychiatric signs and symptoms, atypical neuroleptics are very commonly used. So what are the disease-related symptom evolution despite optimal levodopa therapy? Well, they march on as the disease progress, and it's postural instability, imbalance, freezing, dysarthria, dysphagia, and non-motor symptoms, psychiatric and cognitive. Let's talk a little bit about deep brain stimulation. We brought in deep brain stimulation, and I started doing some work in New York and Kansas in 1992 and 93, and we brought it into San Diego in 1994. We did one of the first cases, and it was very effective. Dr. Cannot was the neurosurgeon. There are other centers that do it. UCSD does deep brain stimulation also, as does Scripps Clinic. It's been shown that it's better than best medical therapy when the patient selection is carefully done. And what is the key to patient selection? No cognitive loss, no neuropsychiatric comorbidity, 
The diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is well-founded and they've had a good response to L-DOPA. Very important. They'll never be better with DBS than they are when they're best with their L-DOPA response. The patient has endose failure and dyskinesias. That's always a benefit because those respond well to DBS. It doesn't give good response, however, to gait abnormalities, freezing, dysarthria, or dysphagia. And in fact, some of those things may be made worse by DBS. At Scripps Memorial Hospital, we've been doing it now for almost 20 years, and our record is very good. We do sometimes in the globus pallidus internus, but we usually do the subthalamic nucleus and put the electrodes in that area. So now let's talk a little bit about some cases to give an idea how I would manage various cases as they present. So these are advanced cases, and this is a patient that's 75 years of age. They've had the disease for five years. That's fairly advanced. The patient lost smell 10 years ago, so the loss of smell was a marker in this case. They had constipation for five years, again another marker, and they've been on L-DOPA 25100 three times a day. With that dose, which is fairly low, they still have three hours of off time, but they don't have dyskinesias. So what is our plan? What is our options? Well, number one, we could increase L-DOPA to a higher dose and keep it at three times a day. The patient would probably get better, have more on time, be maybe less suboptimally improved, and they may also develop dyskinesias. We could give the L-DOPA dose more frequently, and that would reduce the end-dose failure or the wearing off and reduce the three hours of off time. We could add a dopamine agonist. They're cognitively intact, don't have major neuropsychiatric aspects, they don't have a lot of orthostatic hypotension. We could probably add a dopamine agonist, but we would go low and we go slow. We could add resagiline, and maybe in this case, because resagiline has been shown to be a benefit in patients that have endos failure and it'll improve off time by about one hour. Now let's look at case two. Case two is a little different. 78 year old female, 15 years of history of IPD or idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and this is a more advanced case. These patients after 15 years oftentimes have cognitive impairment. By eight to 10 years of disease, 80% of the patients will have cognitive impairment. So this patient does have memory loss. A mini mental state exam is 24. That's significant. There's cognitive impairment. The normal is 30. The patient's on L-DOPA 5200, which is the old Cinemat CR. It's in generic now. It's four times a day. But remember, 5200 sustained release only has bioavailability of 70%. So they're really getting less than 800 milligrams of L-DOPA. And they're on Pramipexol, one milligram four times a day. There's four hours of off time and four hours of dyskinesia. Motor complications are significant. And there's hallucinations at sundown or there's sundowning. So when you look at that dose pattern of drug medication, the first thing we have to talk about is there's memory loss, hallucinations, and the patient's on a dopamine agonist. That's the first thing we want to bring our attention to. And then that the patient maybe could be getting more frequent L-DOPA. So let's look at how we made that plan for that patient. Well, first of all, we needed to stop the dopamine agonist and observe. Now remember, you don't want to just stop, you want to taper. If they have the dopamine agonist withdrawn too quickly, they can become agitated, anxious, depressed, all sorts of cognitive and psychiatric things can occur, and their Parkinson features can dramatically change, and they could also develop a syndrome like neuroleptic malignant syndrome. We want to get off the dopamine agonist, and then we want to switch the L-DOPA from 5200 to 25100, and we'll give it one and a half, which is really 150 milligrams of L-DOPA, four times a day, and later we'll probably want to go to five times a day, or maybe even six. Now in this case, this new drug, Ritari, may be a benefit in this case, and that's a lot of the cases that we'll be reusing this drug for when it comes out. 
we want to repeat the mini mental state exam. And if it's still abnormal, we want to think about adding a acetylcholine esterase inhibitor like Exelon, either the patch or the capsule. The patch has less side effects. And if there's no dementia, we may consider BBS. Now, this patient will probably still have dementia and we won't want to use it. But in case one, if they don't do well, we'll definitely consider using DBS. So what are the future for neurodegenerative diseases in general and for Parkinson's disease? Well, there's going to be a lot more biomarkers. There's going to be molecular markers, but there's going to be also technological markers. The MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging, may pick up atrophy in certain parts of the brain that will help make the diagnosis. The MRI spectroscopy may be a benefit. It's a different type of MRI, and it may be a benefit. Functional MRI probably will be of some benefit, but these are all costly, very high technological tools. Diffusion tensor imaging may play a role, but blood markers, molecular markers are going to be very important. And now CSF markers are considered to be very important. We have the CSF markers in Alzheimer's disease that show that beta amyloid, the abnormal protein, shows that it's low in the spinal fluid and tau, which is also present in Alzheimer's, is high. For Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein is the protein that's abnormal and it aggregates. And it's UCSD, under Dr. Glasgow, they're showing that the alpha-synuclein may well be decreased in Parkinson's patient's spinal fluid, and a TOF that's phosphorylated may be elevated. That data is yet to come out, but it's very analogous to Alzheimer's disease. Genetic markers are going to probably be very important, and about every year or two, there are more genes that are being discovered. The problem is with genetic markers is we don't know yet how to make that a therapeutic advantage. Stem cells are still being studied, but I think we're a long way away from that. And if a new idea of stem cells plays a role, we're going to still have more time that we're going to need to make that an effective clinical procedure. Implantation of trophic hormones are being studied, and they are implanted via viral vectors. So you tag them in with a virus and you put them inside the brain and they give a trophic hormone that may be a benefit and help nurture the cells that are dysfunctional or dying, or maybe keep the cells more alive. New concepts of etiology of dementia are going to play a role. And one area is the white matter dementia concept. I won't go into that tonight, but it's very, very interesting. Those axons are just some tube that's passing down in the brain. They have very significant physiological function and metabolic function. Now, a very important new consideration is the aggregation of alpha-synuclein or beta amyloid, but in our case, alpha-synuclein, acting as an abnormal protein that can be templated and influence other non-affected, non-toxic alpha-synuclein proteins. So the alpha-synuclein is normal in the cell, but it becomes abnormal by its aggregation and it becomes toxic in some way by misfolding. And then it's dumped into this Lewy body. Well, it's now shown that this abnormal alpha-synuclein can probably be templated and affect other non-affected alpha-synuclein proteins in some way transmit this disease. It can act maybe as a transmitter or like a prion transmitter. What do we really need? We need a lot of future investigation, a lot more new drugs. We need a lot more advancement. We need a cure. We need to know the exact etiology. But one of the things that we all can do is have more individual responsibility. You want to have more education. You want to use exercise. You want to have a good surrounding support system. You want to learn as much as you can, and you want to really be involved in clinical trials and also in our Parkinson support group in this area. Exercise looks very good. It's hard to do, but we really want to continue that 
in all of our Parkinson patients, no matter what stage we are in. I want to thank you for being with us on this topic of advances in the diagnosis and treatment of advanced idiopathic Parkinson's disease. This series of programs has been funded by the generosity of the Bell Foundation in honor of Glenn W. Bell, Jr., founder of Taco Bell, and by Elaine and David Darwin.